So being a lawyer who practices in surrogacy in England and Wales does not come without its frustrations. Uh, we've heard from the Law Commission today, from Claire today, about the limitations that we in England um, have to deal with when dealing with surrogacy arrangements and trying to find answers to solutions that um, parents um, pose for us when they come to us and say, I've had a child um, born in Georgia, I um, haven't really thought about this until now, but they were born two weeks ago, I've just gone to try and get a British passport, I can't get a British passport, I need to be back within three weeks because I've got a child at home who's got um, maybe special needs and can't really be away. Um, can you sort it out? And you say, well, no. I'm fortunate because I'm a family lawyer. I say, first step, you need to go and speak to an immigration lawyer. Thankfully, that's not me. Um, and then we'll sort out the um, parentage afterwards. But um, because of the way that the law currently stands, I don't think, and I know that all of the practitioners that I come across who do this kind of work, um, we don't think that the law adequately safeguards and the best interests that are currently being born through surrogacy arrangements to UK parents, either domestically or internationally. Uh, the United Kingdom is not a destination for international couples to undertake surrogacy uh, within the UK. So the domestic surrogacy that takes place, by and large, I'm not saying it's uh, exclusively uh, related to that, but by and large it relates to um, domestic um, couples undertaking surrogacy here, so UK parents undertaking surrogacy within the UK. Um, but we do have a significant number of um, surrogacy uh, of intended parents who undertake surrogacy arrangements overseas. Uh, my practice is mainly dealing with international parents. I think that is reflected of most of the practitioners who do this kind of work, um, because um, we're not, as Claire said, UK um, lawyers are not allowed to be involved in the facilitation of the um, surrogacy arrangements themselves. So advising on the terms of the surrogacy arrangement. If we were to do that, we would um, commit a criminal offence. So the involvement that we can have as family lawyers is fairly limited to the establishment of parental rights. And I'll come on to it a little bit later, but we have a slightly different process for domestic surrogacy, uh, which is more informal, and most people undertake that without lawyers. Um, so let's... What are we dealing with? I mean, what is the, how far has surrogacy spread? What kind of numbers are we thinking about? Well, we don't have any exact statistics in the United Kingdom on the number of children that are born each year through surrogacy. We do have statistics on the number of parental orders that are made each year. And in 2018, in England and Wales, there were 367 parental orders made by the courts of England and Wales which is increasing year on year. By contrast, in 2011, just 117 parental orders were made. So that's a threefold increase uh, of parental orders made in the space of just seven years. And we don't know the precise breakdown, or I don't know the precise breakdown, of um, domestic versus international um, surrogacy arrangements. The uh, consultation paper put out by the UK Law Commission estimates that the three surrogacy organisations in the UK, the not-for-profit organisations, that's Surrogacy UK, Brilliant Beginnings and Cots, um, assist between 60 and 80 intended parents each year. But by no means does that 60 to 80 intended parents reflect the full number of domestic surrogacies that take place in the UK, because we do, that doesn't necessarily account for the independent matches, the um, cases where uh, intended parents have a prior relationship uh, or friendship with the uh, surrogate, or indeed the um, what we see on the ground, uh, a growing number of um, matches made through social media platforms and Facebook and the like. Um, when we look at the number of uh, international cases, uh, I um, found some statistics from CAFCAS, uh, which showed that in 2014 to 2015, CAFCAS, which is effectively the Court Welfare Service in England and Wales, received 242 requests for parental order reports. Of those 242, 38% were allocated to the CAFCAS High Court team. Now, the CAFCAS High Court team is a specialised um, team in London that 
predominantly deals with high court cases, but what that means in parental order cases is that at least 38% in 2014 to 2015 um, were international parents because domestic cases wouldn't be allocated to the high court team, and they lived within London because by 2014, um, somebody in taking an international service arrangement who lived in Nottingham would be allocated a Nottingham officer. So, and we also don't know how many people who undertake surrogacy overseas are applying for parental orders. Um, and there are a number of reasons why people won't apply for parental orders following international surrogacy arrangements. Uh, they are more likely to apply for a parental order following a domestic arrangement, and that's because our um, birth registration legislation um, requires, and the HFEA um, 2008 Act requires the surrogate to be registered as the mother on the birth certificate. And so if you have two men, um, for example, um, and they have a d child through domestic services, they can't go to the register office and register that child's birth because the registrar is going to be wise enough to know that that doesn't happen naturally. And so they will ask where the parental order is. Uh, and so the birth initially has to be registered with the surrogate as the mother. But as we know, in many international arrangements, intended parents come home with the intended parentage reflected on the birth certificate, whether that's by operation of law, following court orders that might have been made in, for example, California, or by operation of law in the Ukraine, where there's no judicial or court process to go through, but that's just the way that the law has developed and how the registration of birth works. Um, so I would estimate that around half, possibly over half of our surrogacy um, of our UK parents are undertaking surrogacy overseas, but it's probably a fairly even split. We've heard that the parental order in the process in the UK is a post-birth process. We know that the legislation says that there is a six-month time limit to make the application, although that's fairly flexible nowadays. But generally speaking, applications are lodged within six months of the child's birth. And, um, as we heard, the consent of the surrogate is not validly given until the child is at least six weeks old. Um, it is possible to lodge the application practically before the child is six weeks old, and you just have to get the consent uh, after the six-week mark. The procedural rules that um, apply to um, parental order applications in England and Wales, uh, and the um, practitioners and the judges in the room who practice in this jurisdiction um, will laugh at this, um, but the procedural rules require that the first hearing for parental order must be heard within four weeks of the application being heard. I issued an application in April and was given a hearing at the end of October, so um, there is a long delay in the courts being able to deal with these uh, administratively um, to get listings. At the first hearing, the rules provide that the court should direct that a parental order report prepare an independent sorry a parental order reporter prepare an independent um, report on the statutory criteria and addressing issues of welfare. A uh, parental order reporter is a qualified social worker who works for the um, CAFAS, the Court Welfare Service, uh, and ordinarily that will entail um, them by appointment um, going to meet with the family normally at home, spend a couple of hours with them. They will talk to them about why they came to surrogacy, what their experience has been, what their relationship is like with their surrogate, um, what, how they plan on telling um, their children about surrogacy. That is a huge aspect of a, a lot of the approach that's taken by um, parental order reporters. And um, with same-sex couples, that's often quite easy because it's obvious to children as they grow up that they have two daddies and they will ask, why, why do I have two daddies? And with some of the heterosexual couples who've struggled with infertility, it might be possible. And previously, I know when I started doing this about eight years ago, I was coming across some intended parents who were saying, this is just going to be a cover-up. You know, I'll, I'll wear a pregnancy suit during pregnancy and you know, to the world at large, I would be the genetic mother. I haven't come across that recently, um, and thankfully so, but um, this is something that the Core Welfare Service is alive to. Um, and the timescales, overall timescales, for a parental order, after the parental order report has come in, the, court, the 
the application comes back for a final hearing, hopefully, uh, if everything is in order. And um, the timescales vary, but I would say between six and eight months is um, a realistic time estimate for most um, UK parental orders. And that process normally, I would say, is slightly quicker in domestic cases. The reason for that is because international cases are heard in the family court by high court judges, and domestic cases are heard in the magistrates, well, in the family court by lay magistrates. So, um, for those of you who are not from this jurisdiction, they're at two far ends of the spectrum in terms of levels of judiciary. So, lay magistrates will be three not legally qualified people. They um, go to court, they, they make decisions in these cases, in the, in the more straightforward cases. Um, high court judges are very experienced, normally very experienced barristers or very experienced judges who've moved their way up through the ranks. Uh, and high court judges are the highest level of first instance judges in this country, which is jurisdiction. So we do have to see a different of approach between domestic and international parental orders. They both apply the same law. So Section 54 of the Human Fertilisation Act applies regardless of whether you are making an application following a child born in Stoke on Trent through surrogacy, or if you are making an application following a child born in San Diego, California. But the approach that the courts take in the international and domestic cases do, from what we see as practitioners, vary. And the main issue is the issue of payments and how the court approaches those issues of payments. And we've seen that Section 54 um, provides that um, the court can that the court needs to be satisfied that no payments other than for expenses recently incurred need to be, could can have been made unless authorised by the court. So in a straightforward altruistic surrogacy arrangement where you have just met the out-of-pocket expenses of the surrogate, you do not need to get the court to authorise retrospectively those payments um, because they are permitted by Section 54. What we see in a lot of domestic cases, and again this is um, as a result of the way that the law stands at the moment in terms of the regulation and the criminal sanctions that exist under the Service Arrangements Act, um, but also I would suggest because um, lawyers are not involved in the um, drawing up of these agreements, is that where in, for example, in a US arrangement, we will be able to produce to the court the surrogacy agreement, we will be able to produce, produce to the court the escrow account so we can show what payments have been made to the surrogate, and we can say, okay, that's for maternity clothing, that's for travel, that's for, um, you know, counselling. But this is the base fee, and we can work out, and it's normally in the US arrangements, it's normally made over instalments of nine or ten instalments over the course of the pregnancy. Um, and that figure is what we ask the court to authorise. In England, we generally don't see that. We see a lot of the arrangements, when arrangements are drawn up, that will say... I will, um, you know, they agree to pay the surrogate her reasonable expenses of £12,000, £15,000. And what's happened on the ground in the magistrate's court is that um, a lot of, there is a going rate, there is a range of acceptable payments that the courts see, and if they fit within that um, rate, they don't require any form of authorisation and um, the first time I did a domestic case, um, I'd done many more international cases um, before I'd done an domestic case. I turned up in front of the magistrate's court with my skeleton argument, going through the bank statements that the um, parents had produced and saying this is, um, this is what they paid. But part of that was for a recuperation holiday. So they'd agreed £12,000, but they said as part of that, that's going to include me being able to take my children on holiday to Tenerife for a week. Um, and I said, well, technically, under the law, that probably needs to be authorised, but I'm asking you to authorise it. You're able to authorise it. Here's the case law. Um, made in good faith. Open and honest in the dealings. No attempt to fraud the authorities with being upfront about it. Uh, and the legal advisor, who is the qualified lawyer who advises magistrates in this country, looked at me and said, this is a consent application. What are you doing? Um, and I said, well, my job. <laughs> um, I have to apply the law and this is what the statute says um, and that is not the approach that I would dare to take in the High Court 
um, and I say that with many of the judges that I appear in front of on a regular basis in the audience, uh, and quite rightly so. Um, but you know, we come back to this um, discussion about whether in the UK we should be allowing payments, whether we are allowing payments already. And when I, in the, prep, in the run up to the consultation paper coming out from the Law Commission, I was absolutely terrified of what the Law Commission was going to say about payments in particular. Because there seems to be, a, even in the professionals and the organisations within the UK that want to see surrogacy reform but don't see surrogacy as exploitative, there is a difference of opinion about whether or not we should allow payments or whether or not we are actually allowing payments now. And I was completely relieved when I read the Law Commission's um, consultation when they said that we've not found the terms altruistic and commercial to be useful descriptions in considering either the current law or possible reforms. Uh, the key difficulty is that the terms themselves can mean different things to different people. In particular, the description of UK law as altruistic has often been linked by stakeholders to the limitation on payments that can be made to surrogates for their expenses. Um, but the link between payments for surrogates and altruism is, however, contested. Now, over the years that I've been doing surrogacy work, I have dealt with lots of types of cases, domestic, international, I've dealt with cases from the US, from Canada, from India, before India closed down, from Thailand, from the Ukraine, from Georgia. And what we see, and particularly I see this quite prevalently in Canadian, and I mean Canadian is more altruistic, similar to the UK model, but particularly in, in, in US um, surrogacy, which is, we would consider a commercial surrogacy, there can, you can have altruism and compensated surrogacy coexisting. Um, one of my first cases that I did in a, a following an American surrogacy arrangement was a second time um, parent. So it was a same sex couple where they had a second child through surrogacy. Their first child, they, they were UK citizens and had lived in the UK, um, but they had lived in the US and they had their first child while they were living in the US, so they didn't do a parental order process for that child. They moved back to the UK, and when I was preparing their evidence, I was asking, what's your um, relationship with your surrogates? And they said, well, which one? Because they had two different surrogates, and they actually had two different egg donors. And what they did in this American uh, commercial en environment, which um, you know, a lot of people see as being you know, exploited, um, they knew their egg donors, they uh, knew their surrogates, and um, whenever they visited the US, and they, they did this every year, they hired a house in, I think it was in actually Massachusetts, um, and they, in the summer, and they had a big garden party, and they invited both of their egg donors and both of their surrogates to come year in, year out. Now, this is fairly unusual. I mean, not, most people will maintain contact with their surrogate and have an ongoing relationship. But what it showed was that although the surrogate and the egg donor, or the surrogate and the egg donors in this case, had um, received compensation. They had been, there was a degree of altruism, and those children will grow up knowing exactly who their surrogate is, exactly who their egg donor is. They're not going to have any questions um, about um, their origins, their, uh, and the circumstances of their birth. And it just really highlighted that even if there is a level of payment involved in these arrangements. It doesn't necessarily mean that you know, those women who received their payments, so if they wanted to walk away and have nothing to do with it, they were fully entitled to, but they clearly wanted to have an ongoing involvement. So they, the two between commerciality and altruism can exist. And we've also seen cases domestically. I, I was involved, I represented a child in a case um, and I know a few of the other lawyers in the case who were also involved in this. Um, it was a reported case of Ms Justice Russell, uh, I think it was called REABC, uh, and there were um, domestic surrogacy. Um, there were same-sex parents. They had traditional surrogates. They had three traditional surrogates within the space of six months. It wasn't through a surrogacy organisation. They met their surrogate online or 
it was kind of facilitated by an online platform through Facebook. And the case became very complicated because they did a lot of media interviews um, following the birth because there was a public interest story because of these two men with three babies aged within six months of each other. And as a result of that, somebody contacted CatCat um, and said, I know this group of people and they um, tell the courts that they paid a much lower fee than, much, made a much lower payment than they actually had. Um, and uh, the court had to grapple with that. And normally, final hearings on parental order applications in the High Court um, take 15, 20 minutes maximum, depends. You know. uh, the judges will have read everything beforehand. Uh, it may, may be slightly longer if there are issues about domicile. Um, this hearing took, I think it was two or three days, hearing evidence with cross-examination from the parties. And, and that was because there was a misunderstanding, really, of what UK law allowed. And actually, what they had paid would have been authorised, which was a case of asking the court to authorise it. So I'm going to end now, um, because um, I see uh, the approach from the end. But um, yeah, so we really do need change in the UK. And uh, yes, thank you.